Hello and welcome to Better System Trader Live. Today we're going to be talking about how to consistently grow your equity using the power of multiple layers of diversification. So let's get to it. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Better System Trader Live. As I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about diversification and how we can use that to consistently grow our equity. And today joining us, our special guest is Nick Raj from the Chartist. Now, Nick Raj has been uh, trading since I think 1985. He started out in the, uh, I think a floor trader on the Sydney Futures Exchange. And uh, he is a specialist in systematic and algorithmic trading strategies. He is a trader, an analyst, an author, an educator, and an all round good guy. So welcome, Nick, how are you today? Yeah, good. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me on again. It's been, uh, it's good to be back. That's for sure. Good to have you back too. Oh, thank you very much. Now you're based up in Queensland, which for people who, who aren't really good with geography is also in Australia on the East Coast. Um, but you're a good couple of thousand kilometres away from me. So you've got nice warm weather and uh, you're not locked down as, as hard as we are down here in Victoria. So I'm quietly jealous, Nick, of you right now. But without making me too much more jealous, how have you been coping the last, I don't know, six or nine months or so with all the crazy stuff that's been going on? Yeah, look, you know, we're pretty unscathed up here. Um, we, we personally, Trish and I were over in Japan when it all started. So we came down and we had to go into lockdown for two weeks, which wasn't particularly nice. So... I mm. do feel for you down there, that's for sure. Um, but look, Queensland's been pretty well unscathed and once we opened up, it's almost business as usual up here. It's school holidays here in Noosa at the moment, so it's very, very busy. Main Beach is busy, oh, yeah, Hastings bet. Street is busy. So it's um, it's pretty good. And the market's treating me well as well, so I've got nothing to complain about. <laughs> nice, I'm very jealous. Anyway, yeah, let's talk about the markets and trading and uh the topic we're going to talk about today is, um, you know, how to grow your equity consistently, which I think all traders want. And, uh, you know, I think probably one of the best ways or perhaps the best way is through diversification. And I think it was, was it Markowitz who said something like uh, diversification is the closest thing to a free lunch for, well, he was about investing, but, you know, I think it applies to trading as well. Um, so. You know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're going to share with us. But how about we start with some of the basics first, just so that we're all on the same page. So can you share uh, exactly what is diversification and what are some of the, uh, I guess, the challenges or issues in trading that we're trying to address by using diversification? Sure. I guess there's two ways to address diversification, Andrew. Um, one would be your more traditional way. And I guess, you know, you've had some of these uh, commodity traders on your podcast earlier on. Um, you know, they look at diversification by trading very completely different markets, you know, a vast array, 50, 60 different commodity markets, corn, wheat, financials, foreign exchange, all sorts of different things. Um, mm. The theory there is that, you know, these markets are uncorrelated. They react very differently to different situations and trends will appear and they'll ride them up and down. Um, I'm not quite like that. So predominantly what I've been doing um, for the last 30-odd years is trading equities um, and only on the long side. I stopped really trading on the short side back during the GFC for two reasons. First of all, uh, short selling in Australia was completely banned back then. And second of all, uh, borrowing stock is now a very, very difficult thing. The regulator really shut it down due to mm. some unfortunate circumstances back then. It's very, very difficult in Australia to borrow stock to sell short. So, you know, I favour long-only strategies. Um, and whilst some could argue that that's not diversification, well, some of our strategies, which I'll show you, do perform in certain periods of times when you would expect a long-only strategy not to perform. And we'll show mm. some examples of that as we go through. Yeah. So basically, the whole context here one thing that I've learned over the many, many years is that traders, retail traders expect profitable trading or uh, professional traders to be making money every day, every week, every month, every year. And that's just not the case um, regardless. Your best traders in the world will have situations where they will have flat periods, they'll have drawdowns, they'll have frust frustrating periods. And 
I'm a true believer in thinking the main difference between a professional and an amateur trader is a professional is someone who can push through those difficult periods mm. of time, keep applying the strategy for the long term and, and forego what's going in the short term noise. And yep. I really do believe that's, that's a big difference. You know, if you can take a very simple strategy with obviously a positive expectancy edge and just trade it for the long term, you're going to be a lot better off and trying to find the next big winning trade um, that we all read about on Twitter and social media <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the whole context of diversifying across different strategies is that I understand that strategies, any kind of strategy, regardless how good they are, will go through those periods of uh, frustratingly sideways, even drawdowns, that kind of stuff. So rather than trading a portfolio of shares, I trade a portfolio of different strategies. Mm, yeah. So I think that's a, yeah, that's a really important point you make about strategies uh, yeah, go through, going through periods of poor performance and then good performance. But I think diversification is a bit of a funny thing because I think for a lot of traders, it's kind of like, well, I know about diversification. I know I'm supposed to do it, but I think a lot of traders still don't really go for that. Like I, I, you know, I, I receive quite a few emails from traders who say, um, you know, I've been working on this system for five years and I think it's ready to go. And I'm like, well, good on you for having the persistence, but, you know, there's a whole lot of <laughs> issues with doing that and you've just touched on a few there. And, um, you know, even in your explanation then, you, you, you kind of touched on a few ways to diversify, a, a few different ways. So how about we start talking about a couple of those individually and um, pick your brains a little bit more. So one of the first ones you did mention was um, countries and markets. So uh, you gave a couple of good examples there, but do you want to share a little bit more about your own experiences trading uh, different markets, how you go about selecting them, that kind of thing? Well, again, I only personally only trade Australia and the US and I'm, I'm probably going to be adding Canada at the end of the year. Um, obviously, the US, well, well, let's start Australia. I'm Australian. I live in Australia. It's my home country market. So obviously, I'm going to be trading that. Um, but we have to be realistic that the US market offers a huge array of opportunities and a huge array of liquidity as well. And the other benefit of trading the US market compared to the Australian market is it's extremely cheap to trade it, especially when we start talking short-term strategies, which I now do a fair amount of. Um, the Australian market is, by, uh, by and hold, um, or by, by all means, quite expensive compared to the US. Um, so trading the US market for short-term systems makes sense in that respect. Um, I guess a good place to probably start is, you know, people get frustrated when they go through a tough period of time. Um, I've seen it time and time again. Um, I've seen it with my clients. You know, I've got portfolios that we've been running very successfully for, for decades, yet people jump on board and after three months they turn around and say, this thing's not working, and mm -hmm. they go off looking for something else. And I call that the beginner's cycle. And I think it's very, very typical where someone comes into this game with uh, the wrong expectation. That's the expectation they expect to make money consistently, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to happen that way. You've got to be realistic about that. But they still have that expectation. And they'll trade some kind of a strategy. They'll go into a course. They'll read a book. They'll, they'll find something to trade. And when they get into that period of time where there's going to be a drawdown or they've been trading it for two months, their account equity hasn't moved a great deal, they'll get frustrated and they'll yeah. want to change and they'll flip to something else and that other strategy will then run into the same problem. They just keep following their tail backwards and forwards. Um, a good example, perhaps if you bring up that first slide, Andrew, that I sent through to you. Um, yeah, sure. This, this is a strategy that I personally trade. And it's going to give you a very good indication. This is a real equity curve, by the way, mm -hmm. for the last four or five years. And it'll give you a good indication of, of potentially what a, a long-term, very successful system can actually go through in the short term. So if we're able to bring that up. That's the second slide, this one? Uh, no, the one before that. Sorry? Yeah, that one there. That one? Yeah. Yep. So this is a strategy that I trade. It's called the high frequency strategy, and it's a short-term swing strategy on the Russell 1000. 
So we trade a portfolio of stocks and the average hold period for this is about three days. If we were to put a style on this strategy, we would call it mean reversion. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you can have a look there from January 2015 over the next couple of years, uh, the strategy returned around 30% net, okay? And then that's at point one you can see there on the screen. And from that point downwards, uh, over the next year or so, we went into a drawdown and we pretty well gave everything back. So between point one and point two, we've given everything back. Now, two things. If you had started right back there in January 2015 and you're now in sort of 2019 and your account is back to where it started, you're probably going to be pretty frustrated about that. You've yeah. been doing all this work. Your account's back where it's begun. You've made no profit. There's got to be something better out there. That's generally the line of thought. Um, if you had started at point one and gone backwards, well, you're now in a nice drawdown. Mm. You've probably got the hump. You're probably saying, well, this is a pretty crap strategy. Um, and at point two, you're thinking, damn it, I'm going to give this up. I'm going to go and look for something else. And you throw it in. And, yep. of course, what happens we have a year like this year comes along and we're up 31 or 32 percent. Now, at point three, the person who's chucked it in at point two is going, Oh, damn, I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> um, or they've joined another strategy that has gone sideways or down for whatever reason. So they keep chasing their tail, if you like. Yeah. Now, what this does is it encourages people to attempt to time a strategy and that's a question I get all the time what's the best time to start the answer is always the same the best time to start any strategy is 20 years ago that's the best time to start <laughs> um, but I can't predict what's going to happen in the near term I don't know what this market's going to do nobody does I've been in this for 35 years I've not met anyone who has a fair idea of what's going to happen in the next one week two weeks two months whatever yeah so the number one thing you can do is find a solid strategy and apply it for the long term. Now, you're going to go through these frustrating periods of time like you can see in this particular chart. The way to overcome it is not to attempt to time when to turn the system on and when to turn it off. That's the wrong thing to do. Mm. What you should actually do, in my view, is add a complementary system. So if we go to slide number two, what we'll see here is a completely different system. Now, what we have here is the same original US high frequency strategy with the blue equity line. And we have a trend following strategy that trades the ASX. Now, this is a, a slightly longer term trend following strategy. It uh, holds positions on average for about nine months. And as you can see, over this period of time, it's had reasonably good performance and it's filled a gap where the other system has failed. Now, the obvious question that's probably going to come to mind is, well, <laughs> why bother trading the US high frequency and just trade that ASX growth portfolio? Yep. Well, the unfortunate thing is they go hand in hand because in different environments they perform quite differently, and this is what makes it really, really interesting. So you can see here that... Whilst their equity today has more or less met at the same point, we've got the same return, it's been a different journey for both of them. If you're just relying on trading that high frequency, you would have had probably a frustrating journey and you probably yeah. would have been inclined to throw it in and move on. But let's now take a look at these two strategies in a very different environment. Let's flip to the next slide. And what we have here is the exact same two strategies, but during the GFC. Hmm. Now, the growth portfolio there, the red line, it goes to cash. So it sits in cash and you can see there from around early 2008 all the way through to early to mid 2009, it sat there in cash. Now, in the real world, when this happened back then, we had a lot of pushback for clients. So we started our business back in, uh, well, the 90s, but we started this particular service was released to the public in 2006. So this was the first time since release that this strategy got actually switched into cash. Mm -hmm. And in the near term, what happens, a lot of people push back. Why are we paying you, Nick? Why are we paying you to sit in cash? We should be doing something. Surely there's something to do in this market. 
It wasn't until the end of 2008, early 2009, after the market had fallen 50% and we'd been sitting in cash the whole time that people realised, oh, that was actually a pretty smart thing to do. It was a smart thing to do for a variety of reasons. One, obviously, capital preservation. That's pretty clean. But also, very importantly, your psychological fortitude was still there. You know, coming back from a 50% loss is a pretty difficult thing. Coming back from a 12% loss, which we had, is a lot easier. So in 2009, it was a lot easier for our clients, at least, to switch the system back on because they hadn't lost that much money. Other people who had lost a lot of money, the last thing they wanted to do is actually buy stocks. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing with our discussion here on diversification. You can see that the high-frequency strategy, even though it's a long-only mean reversion strategy, performed exceptionally well in that type of environment. And if we think of what's gone in the last few years and what the environment was back then, it's one of volatility. Yes, in the last few years, we've had a little bit of volatility here and there, short, short periods of it. Back during the GFC, it was volatility every single day. You know, every single day Mm. the market was swinging backwards and forwards by a large percentage. And that's exactly what that high-frequency strategy really uh, plays to. That's what it likes. And that's why just in the last, you know, three, four, five months, it's done exceptionally well because we have had that volatility in the market that's come back. So this is a good example of sticking to two strategies and how one will... um, benefit the other for whatever reason the market environment is Mm. so i think that's a pretty good indicator of of how you can put two very different strategies together even though they're long only and even though they're trading the same asset um, and they can work very very nicely together so putting something like a trend following strategy and a shorter term mean reversion style strategy together i believe would be an absolute base uh, mm. point of point of start. You know, that's that's what where you would start. Uh, I obviously go a lot further than that, which we'll which we'll discuss shortly. Yep. But I, I think for any new trader, that should be your goal. You know, certainly for my students in my trading system mentor course, that's the goal I want them to achieve: to have at least two systems working together and not correlated. The correlation between these two is 0.22. So right. that's pretty good. Um, long only equity is 0.22. That's pretty good, right? Mm. Yeah. How often do you measure that correlation? Do you do you review it every uh, periodically, or? Well, I just look at it for the longer term. I mean, right. I, I'm not allocating funds to one or the other based on you know the, the correlation or the returns yeah. or anything like that. They they both have an allocation. And that allocation stays through thick and thin. So, for example, back there during the GFC, when the growth portfolio went into cash, I didn't take that money out and do something else with it. I didn't allocate it to this high-frequency strategy. That's the allocation to that strategy, and that's the way it stays. The fact that it sits in cash is actually part of the strategy itself. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, we can earn some interest on that. Um, you could do something else, for example, like put it into some kind of a bond ETF, something like that to get a little bit more out of it. Um, but at the end of the day, seeing, sitting in cash was a pretty safe way to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, flat is a position too, right? And I think right. especially beginner traders, they just want to get in and they want to do lots of trades and make lots of money. And you know, as you mentioned there, sometimes the best uh, position is just to sit back, let everything blow over and then jump in later on. So that's um, that's a good example there. I want to um, dig into a little bit more about why not short systems as well. You did touch on a point about um, you know, borrowing and, and things that can happen, especially during uh, times of crisis. Is that the, the main issue? Is that the main reason why you don't explore short or is there something else to it? Why don't you also diversify between long and short? Yeah, look, you're absolutely right, and I, I think that is a, a failure of mine to actually pursue short side systems. Um, certainly some of my students in the Trading System Mentor course are now trading short side systems. Um, excuse me. Um, and, yes, that's something that I've really got to, you know, get my ass into gear and, and get working <laughs> on. Um, I've got no problems trading on the short side morally or, or whatever else. It's certainly plausible. I would only do it in the US market. I wouldn't do it in the Australian market. Um, but it's just not something that I've got around to as yet. 
I've not really had too much success in designing short side systems mm. that that meet my benchmark. I've got certain benchmarks that I like to to have, um, and I've not come up with a trading or short side trading system that really meets those benchmarks accordingly. So until I get to that, um, I, I just you know aren't, aren't going down that route. Yeah, okay. We've actually got a question in the chat from Ola, which is uh, just touches on something you just mentioned. Um, let me uh, show it up on the screen here. As strategies ebb and flow in performance, how do you allocate funds between them? Okay, so as, as I just mentioned, um, I don't move money between strategies if one's gone to cash or whatever it's not like i take the money out and throw it into another one i allocate based on um a few a few different things which we'll get into we talked about signal dilution before signal luck dilution um and that's one of the reasons but yep. generally if a strategy gets so far out of whack with the other strategies i can and will move um funds back the other way, if you like, and yeah. that's gone on in one of my slides, which we'll see soon. Um, there is a disparity with my micro cap portfolio in Australia compared to the others, mainly because this year it's had a cracking year. I think it's up fifty nine or sixty percent. Wow. So at the end of this year, I'm going to have to rebalance that portfolio again. Mm. Um, but I don't do it on a very regular basis. It's only when they really get out of whack. Yeah, okay. Another question here actually from, uh, this one's from Geo. The problem with trading the US markets, this is obviously for Australian or outside of US, can be at times that you uh, you can lose or win with the currency exchange movement. So how do you manage that, um, you know, that difference there? Yep, well, so the main area where that becomes a threat is if you're holding long-term positions, which I do do. And very easily we hedge that away using currency futures. So um, I've got a I've got a hedging mechanism, if you like. It's a pretty simple strategy that I use on the Aussie dollar. And when that triggers, we put on a hedge by buying Aussie dollar futures, and that way we we alleviate the risk of the FX. Um, it's a, it's a simple strategy. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's not a straight trading strategy in and of itself. It's a hedging tool. Um, so, yeah, that's the way you overcome it. Yeah, yeah. I um, I trade futures exclusively now and, uh, you know, my my trading accounts are in US accounts and US dollars. So uh, the exchange rate especially, you know, can move quite a lot over the course of a year between Australia and US. So it's definitely something to keep in mind for traders who are, trading markets that are not in their home um, currency, I guess. Uh, yeah, definitely something yeah. to look so out the, for. The simple premise is that when the Aussie dollar rises and you hold US dollar assets, you're going to lose money on that. So that's yeah. why you would buy um, Aussie dollar futures um, and that would hedge it for you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's yeah. the cheapest way to do it as well. Yep. Yeah. Now, so we've just gone through, uh, you've mentioned um, uh, diversification across markets and um, also stylistically, I guess you could say, but I know you've got some more slides to share with us. So do we want to move on to the next one? Yeah. So this just gives you a bit of an idea um, of the country allocations that right. I currently have. Um, so predominantly, um, I, I recently reweighted more into the US. I was predominantly in Australia, but uh, over the last few years I've now balance that up, try and get it to 50-50. Mm. Uh, as I said, I will be hopefully adding Canada to the mix at some stage um, and depending on account structures and, and that kind of stuff will depend on how much I allocate. When I say account structures, so I, I have money sitting in three different brokerage accounts under three different entities and depending on, you know, some of those entities, for example, my retirement account, there's only so much I can do with that. I can't... Mm. You know, I can't day trade that money, so that's going to be limited as to what it can do. Um, and as that account grows, it might grow out proportionally to the other ones. So it just depends. So that's the current allocation. You can see it's about 50-50 Australia, US. They're looking to add Canada at the end of the year as well, which should 
from my very, very, very early research on it, should show profiles similar to the kind of models that I trade in Australia. But we'll yeah. see. Was that the, is that the main reason why you chose Canada? The main reason why I chose Canada is because that's where the accurate data is. Put it right. that way. We, we, with our systems, we want the most accurate data. Um, yep. We use Norgate data and it has historical constituents that enables us to be able to test our systems without any survivorship bias or anything like that. So very, very accurate data, uh, and they're about to probably introduce data for Canada over the next couple of months, which uh, would which right. be fantastic. Yeah. So I know we get a lot of um, viewers and listeners in the States um, who may... Uh, you know, may not want to go to Australian markets, do you think Canada is a good choice for them or how else can they diversify against the US markets? Um, well, the, the key would be to use different strategies in the US market. Right. Um, and again, some of these slides that we'll go through here, you can see how I do it across the Australian market and the US market. Um, but yeah, look, I, I guess... No disrespect to our friends in the US, but a lot of the time they don't think there's anything outside their own borders worth trading, but there is. Um, and Canada may be one of those markets they can look at, certainly a much more smaller market, that's for sure. Mm. Certainly a resource-based market like Australia, so there could be some opportunities there. Um, so, uh, look, you know, it's up to the individual. All this kind of diversification comes down to your willingness to be open to that stuff. It also comes down, obviously, to time and uh, capital. You know, if you don't have that much capital, then diversifying across multiple strategies may not be an option. Mm. But um, certainly I think uh, trading outside your home country does offer benefits and uh, Canada would probably offer US clients some kind of a benefit, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I've got a question here from Zach. Zach would like to know, have you ever tested or considered a blended trend following equities and futures portfolio? Um, so my first 17 years of trading was futures. I was a uh, fund manager, ran my own commodity trend following fund. Mm -hmm. um, I wound that up in 2001 for a variety of business reasons rather than anything else and moved into equities. So that growth portfolio that I showed you earlier on um, which is my, well, was my main trend following strategy for my retirement account. That was originally my trend following strategy for my futures trading. Mm. So I simply took the exact same model, made one adjustment to it, and have been trading that on equity since 2001. Now, I personally don't trade futures from a trend following perspective anymore. That's just a personal choice. I do trade futures from a hedging perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, reasonably rarely, but it does happen. Um, it's certainly something that, you know, one could look at. Uh, I certainly have no problems with futures, but, um, you know, I I'm just happy with equities. Maybe that's a function of age, <laughs> whatever, but um, it certainly could be something to be investigated, that's for sure. Yeah, yep. I'm and obviously... The, sorry, an gone. alternate way to do it, sorry, an alternate okay. easy way to do it would be to invest with one of these managed futures companies who have been around for 20, 30 years. You know, there's there's a few mutual funds out there now that give you access to that that, that didn't back in the day. And it's certainly a, a lot of a uh, lower entry bar, if you like, to trade a portfolio, a diversified portfolio of futures. Really, you know, you, you're looking, you'd need at least four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars to really give that a, a proper go. I'd say. Yeah. I'm obviously biased towards futures because that's what I trade, but I think personally uh, it's easier to get diversification because a lot of the markets have different um, characteristics and personalities. And I think especially when, uh, you know, when, when we have times of crisis, a lot of, um, a lot of stocks will just, um, you know, correlation will, will, will meet. So I think, me personally, I think there's it's easy to get diversification in futures, but um, you might think otherwise. Well, look, this is an interesting topic, okay, because there is certainly a group out there that espouse that the only way to diversify is to have a broad base of futures contracts. Yeah. 
here's two things with that, right? Here's my problem with those, that comment. One, are we now trading just to diversify or are we trading for good risk-adjusted returns? Because mm. at the end of the day, my view is everyone comes into trading to make money. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the turtles weren't talking diversification 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It wasn't even on the agenda. They yeah. were purely and simply trading to make as much money as possible. Their whole regime has now changed. It's all about diversification now. It's all about uh, this key market risk and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'm not entirely on board with that kind of talk, at, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, the other thing is assuming we are trading for good risk-adjusted return, let's compare my returns to that of a completely diversified trend-following commodity fund because mm. mine are better. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, a lot of these guys are producing 12% annualised returns, maybe 14% annualised returns with 30 35% drawdown. Mm. Now, I don't know, mate, that's, if, if, that's, if that's the end game, what, what exactly is diversification providing you, mm. you know? That's my point. You can get better risk-adjusted returns trading long-only equities than what you can with that. That's the truth of it. Mm. Um, so, you know, it sounds good in theory. I get what you're saying. In theory, it makes sense. It makes logical sense. But in reality, that's not really what's happening. Yeah, you make some good points there, Nick. And I know we're, uh, we've got some more slides to go in a minute. I just want to... Uh, there's a couple been a couple of comments while you were talking there, so I just want to raise um, here. Adam Adam Jansen um, made a comment: the the personality of the futures market is really the psychology and thus personality of the trader. What do you think about that? Right, is so, coming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, that's fine. It's yeah. but at the end of the day, we're we're here to make money. You know, I haven't met one yeah. person who wants to get into trading for any other reason than to make money, you know, that reason may change over time. It's like this yeah. argument that people take profit, you know, scale out. I mean, really, mathematically, it's the worst thing you can do. At mm. the end of the day, we come into this game to make as much money as possible. Okay, I get it. It might make you feel a little bit more comfortable. It might smooth your equity curve, whatever. But yeah. at the end of the day, the basic foundation is we are coming into this to make as much money as we can, okay? That's really what it's all about. So do the futures markets operate on a different personality level or psychology? I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, markets are market. Participants are participants. They're human yep. beings. They're all going to operate the exact same way. Look at lumber. You know, we've had this massive trend and a massive collapse. Uh, crude oil, massive collapse, big trends back. It's same old, same old. You know, markets are markets and they're being played by the same participants. Yeah, yeah. One more question for you before we move on. Um, this one is from Scousend. Do you consider the volatility of your strategies when deciding your allocations? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't look at volatility. Um, it's not one of the metrics that I, that I do look at. Um, I'm looking mm. at the correlations between the different strategies. I'm looking into the different styles, which we're about to go into here. I guess the main metrics that I look for, I, and again, I, I mentioned earlier on that I had two sort of benchmarks that I try to uh, try to get towards. Those two benchmarks are the first and foremost, I'm not going to touch a strategy that has a, an annualised return of less than 15%. So everything that I want to trade has to have an annualised return in excess of 15%. The second benchmark is I want a strategy with a MA ratio of at least one. Now, I'm happy to follow. So those that don't know what a MA ratio, it's your annualised return divided by your maximum drawdown over the history of the strategy. Yep. So, for example, if I've got a strategy that has a 15% annual return, I really want the maximum drawdown to be a maximum of 15%. That's your MAR ratio of one. Mm -hmm. Now, with trend following and momentum strategies, I give that a little bit of leeway, like 0 0.8, 0 0.85, something like that. Um, but I'm not going to go and trade a strategy that has a MAR ratio of like 0 0.3. 
So mm. they're the two benchmarks that I look for. Um, so drawdown is important to me. Um, I don't want to have any strategy that has really, really deep drawdowns. Um, and we'll talk about that hedge tool that, um, that I sent you a slide on as well, which, yep. you know, my biggest concern has always been another 1987. I, I I was trading in 1987 and I blew up in 1987. So mm. ever since, that's been my biggest worry. And I believe what we've just seen here in March is or was the equivalent of 1987. Um, so, you know, overcoming those kind of risks are, are also very important. Yeah, yeah. Now we've got a lot of other questions, but uh, I want us to keep moving on because I know you've got some other great stuff to share. So... Um, should we hit the slide? So we've done, you're just talking about country allocation. Yep. Okay. So this particular slide here is the style allocation, if you like. Now, I am a trend follower. I have been literally since day one. During the GFC, however, when all my trend strategies went to cash, I started investigating other strategies that could basically take, take their place, if you like. Uh, and that's when I started looking at mean reversion style strategies um, and so on and so forth. So what we've got here is uh, we've got ASX absolute trend following. So absolute trend following is when we're looking at uh, you know, your standard trend following that you would read about from one of Michael Cavell's books, something like that, Jerry Parker style, turtle style. We look at the individual markets on their own. All I'm doing is I'm looking at individual stocks on their own. Uh, I've written a book, Unholy Grails, which outlines eight different trend-following style strategies. Uh, I trade one very similar to one that's in that book. Mm -hmm. um, relative momentum. Now, this one is very new for the ASX for me. Um, it's only just been introduced. And relative momentum is when we compare the momentum of stocks against each other. So I might be looking at a basket of 500 stocks. I'm going to be asking the question, which one of these is trending up and then put those in a basket and then I'm going to say of these ones that are trending up, which ones are trending up the best or the fastest, if you like, has the most momentum. Mm. Um, then we've got US relative momentum strategies. I trade a couple of these, which we'll get into very shortly. Same kind of style. So these are weekly and monthly rotation style strategies. Um, the US mean reversion. That's one that uh, I started trading back in 2010 uh, from my research, still trade that one today. So that's the high frequency strategy. It's got an average hold period of about three days. And then in more recent years, I've gone down a different level to even day trade strategies as well, just in the US market. Um, some of you might be thinking, oh, well, this is a lot of work, but a lot of it is automated. So to give you an idea with the day trade strategy, I'm not watching the market. It's been run by an API. All I do is put my account balance in my computer, push a button. It does the position sizing. It generates the orders. The orders get uploaded to an API and up to the broker platform. And then the API manages them through the night. When I wake up in the morning, I've got a P&L sitting there and that's it. Mm -hmm. So we'll break these strategies down a little bit further. But basically what we're doing here is we're diver diversifying across different countries we're diversifying across different styles and also across different time frames so we've got positions here that you know can last up to nine months ten months on average and then we've got the day trade strategy which holds positions for you know just for a few hours all of them have positive expectancies uh, over the longer term and they're all doing very very different things some of them use regime filters, which we were talking to Cesar last week about. Yeah. Um, others don't. So the short-term ones, they have no regime filters whatsoever. They trade all the time. They aren't only long-only strategies, but they do trade during bear markets as well. Mm. Okay. Um, there's a lot of, uh, just looking at this slide on style allocation, there's a lot of different styles there. Where would you recommend people who are just going to get started? I mean, you've given a lot of options there. Could seem a little bit overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, first and foremost, and this is my biased opinion, I am a trend follower. But, you know, most of my money is allocated to trend following slash momentum style strategies. And to me, that's just the easiest way to make money in the market. 
um, in terms of creating a positive expectancy, really mm -hmm. trend fine, cut your losses, let your profits run. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're easy to trade psychologically, but from a mathematical perspective, I believe that's the place where people should get involved because it's very hands off, very low commission drag, um, and it's very easy from a lifestyle perspective to actually trade a trend following strategy. Some of mine are monthly strategies where I actually don't do anything at all for the whole month, place the orders at the start of the month, don't look at it, repeat the process next month around. So creating a positive expectancy or that edge is the number one thing, regardless of the style of strategy. And I think trend following personally is the easiest way to achieve that. So a trend following mm. strategy. If, if you're still new, what I would suggest is look at a trend following strategy um, and then in six to 12 months, once you're happy with that, then look to add a secondary um, complementary strategy such as a mean reversion or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, just one question here. I think you may have touched this a little bit already. This is from Ola. Ola would like to know, would your rotational strategies use cash as an option? Um, okay, so I'm assuming do they go to cash during a bear market? The answer is yes. Mm. Um, but you could include a bond ETF. Um, in the US market, the longer bonds are certainly the better ones. So what is it, the TLT, uh, the longer, what's that, a 20-year, is that the 20 to 30-year bond, the TLT? Um, it, it would add value instead of just going to cash, especially in this environment. So, yeah. Okay. All right, let's continue with the slides. We've got a few more to get through. So that one was style allocation. Okay. All right, so this one's getting a little bit more complex. So this <laughs> basically breaks down um, all the different strategies that I personally trade. Now, this is probably a point, Andrew, we should start talking about signal luck. Um, we yes. talked about this a couple of days ago. Um, so, and I think it's also good to have a discussion about this in light of you were speaking with um, Cesar last week on regime filters. So signal luck is... And I look at it from a from a very big picture perspective. So signal luck, how can I explain this easily? Let's think of this year. Let's think about what happened in March. Um, we let's assume we run a monthly rotational strategy. We're one hundred percent long equities, and March comes along. Now, you know, in my view, March was very similar to the eighty seven crash, basically. It caught a lot of people off guard. A lot of big money managers lost a lot of money. The markets across the board became very, very correlated, regardless of the asset price. Um, and as a result, you know, the smartest guys on the, on the block lost money. Now, signal luck is having some kind of exposure to that market or not. So to give you an idea, I exited all my long positions in the US on the 1st of March. It was just lucky. My regime filter switched off and I was able to be in cash when that market collapsed mm. and obviously when the market rebounded, I got back in again. Now, to give you an idea on how lucky I was, and it was only luck, and we'll use uh, Caesar's um, discussion last week on regime filters. So let's say um, you've got a rotational strategy that uses a 300-day moving average as a rotational filter. So if the market is below the 300 day, you switch off and you exit all positions. If the market is above the 300 day, you stay invested, okay? Now, Caesar did mention that he kind of just uses broad numbers, and I completely agree with him in that context, okay? So 300 around kind of number. But if you had been using a 200 day, now just on that, if you had been using a 300 day moving average as your regime filter, you would have been invested and held on to your positions through March and you would have had a 30 or 35% drawdown. However, had you been using a 280-day rather than a 300-day moving average, you would have exited all your positions on the 1st of March and you would not have had that significant drawdown. And that is what I'm talking about in terms of signal luck, okay? 
the difference between a 280 day moving average and a 300 day moving average in the scheme of things is nothing but in this one instance hmm. it was absolutely everything does that make yep. sense yeah absolutely yeah okay so we can extrapolate and remove that well dilute that risk we can never remove the risk okay markets are risky that's why we get a return from them okay if you don't want any risk stick your money in the bank i can guarantee you won't make anything either so there's various <laughs> ways we can actually dilute that risk so one of the ways we can dilute the risk for example using a rotational strategy in the us uh, if we have a look at the ones on the screen here um, we have that US TLT premium portfolio, okay? So that is an aggressive rotational strategy that I trade on the NASDAQ 100. This year, that strategy is up around 61%. Um, and to alleviate that risk of what we saw at the start of the year, it operates on two sub-portfolios. So half the money in that portfolio gets allocated to a monthly rotation, and the other half trades the exact same strategy but on a weekly rotation. Mm. So what we're doing is we're diversifying the actual signals inside the exact same system, and that takes that removes some of that risk of capturing the big downdraft at the start of the month. There's nothing worse when it's the fourth day of the month, you're fully invested and the market starts cratering, you think, oh, gosh, I've got to sit here for another 20 days. Uh, and this market can mm. fall a long way in 20 days, as it did in March. Whereas if you've got a weekly system, you're going to remove some of that because the system will get itself out. So that's an example right there. Another one, for example, my retirement account. For the last 15 or 20 years, it's traded a single strategy, okay, that growth portfolio that we can see there. Now, that account got to a significant size, so much so that I thought, well, hold on a sec. Am I being too reliant on this one single strategy? So mm. I decided to diversify away from that. So within my retirement account, I put half the money or kept half the money in that growth portfolio. That's been running at about a 16% annual return for the last 20 years or something. But I also put half of the money into a weekend trend trader, which is a completely different strategy trading on the, a different part of the ASX. And again, it's to diversify. Now, to give an example, this year, the growth portfolio is up about 4%. The weekend trend trader is up about 50%. <laughs> so two completely different parts of the market, two different um, strategies, two different, uh, they're both trend following strategies, but one is a breakout or they're both breakout strategies, I guess, but one is weekly, one is daily. Um, and trading different parts of the market as well. One trades mid caps and one trades micro caps. So it's just about diversifying the risk of being exposed to a single strategy, if you like. And you can see right across the board, I'm doing all sorts of different things, different markets, different time frames, different strategies. And that's the sole reason to do it. But I stress again that to some, this may appear to be a heck of a lot of work, but a lot of it's automated. It really doesn't take too much. I would spend no more than 10 minutes a day operating these strategies. Mm. I think this um, this signal luck dilution is a really important topic to consider. And after we were chatting about it the other day, I was thinking about how, how can I, not just in a portfolio sense, but all across the different aspects of trading, where are the areas where I'm relying on luck? And you think about it, there is a lot. There's like in your entries, but you've got, if you've got indicators, what parameters do you use? Um, when do you start testing your, or back testing your strategy? Because you move that forward or back, it can get very different results. When do you start trading strategies live? You shift it by a month or two, you can get very different results. And I think it, it's interesting to consider because it kind of makes you, um, assess your process more and look at things from a slightly different angle. And, and I've come up with a, a number of different ideas for myself, that, which I'm going to test. But um, I think you raise a, an important point that people don't really consider that much, and that is, you know, the impact of luck on, on your strategies and, and what you're doing. Yeah, well, there's a really good book by Morgan Housel that I've just finished reading. Uh, it's called The Psychology of Money. It's relatively new. It's only got released last month, I think. 
Um, and he he makes the same points on a bigger macro scale. You know, mm. you think, you know, we look at Warren Buffett um, as, you know, the world's greatest investor and that may be the case, but is he just an outlier? Is he just in the right place at the right time in the right environment? Um, same with a lot of these commodity yeah. trend following guys. You know, you think about it, uh, they had very, very early success in the 80s and in the 90s. But now with interest rates at zero, it's a very, very different game for them. Um, mm. Was their early success just luck? Um, you know, these kind of things. I don't, I'm not saying that it is, but I think there are risks there that you, you can't see until after the fact, you know. So the whole idea here is to diversify as best as you can across strategies, markets, whatever, um, and even right down to signal timing, you know, um, I mm. think that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do we want to continue on with the slides? I'm not sure how many we have left there. Sorry, I can't see. So um, we let's was... move through the let's let's just go to this last one if you like, Andrew, on okay. this hedge tool. Um, just there we that go. That one there. Yeah, you know, the S and P 500. Yeah. So. You know, this is one area that I had been working on um, to alleviate the risks. As I said, my biggest concern was being fully invested in a 1987 come along. Now, obviously, diversifying different systems can alleviate that. Um, mm. But the other obvious thing was if we're going to hold positions from a month-to-month -month basis, do we have some kind of a hedge in place? So this is a hedge tool that I've been working on for a couple of years. Um, the biggest problem I've been finding to get a hedge on is being reactive. I didn't want to be reactive. I wanted to be proactive. I wanted the hedge to be on before the market rolled over, not once the market rolled over, because generally it's the initial sell-off that creates all the damage, especially when you're trading high beta stocks in the NASDAQ 100 as an example. So this hedge tool was designed to be a little bit more predictive. It's not it's not perfect, but you can see here on the chart that the signals come just before the big sell-offs come. And mm -hmm. interestingly, we had some signals back there at, uh, at the end of August. Um, and at this stage, it's still unfolding to see where we would go now. So this is based on a couple of different breadth indicators and a couple of different technical indicators. And it's a warning sign, if you like. So this could be helpful for people that run monthly. Um, strategies that could be exposed for a full month. Um, obviously, you know, one way we can dilute that is by having week, weekly signals in there as well, but this would be another way. So the whole idea here is we get a sell signal or we get the hedge signal there where it's high risk. You might want to be able to hedge some of your portfolio, 50% of it or something like that, and just take some of the, um, some of the sting out of it if we do get a sell-off. Mm. Yeah, the, the, looking at that chart there, it looks like there could potentially be a long way to go from here. What are your thoughts about uh, what could be uh, on the horizon? Look, I'm not one to predict. Um, I'll, you know, I remain 100% long equities in the US. I think, quite frankly, it's going to come down to what's going to happen with this election. Mm. Um, I think we're probably going to have some sideways trading for the next month until the election is done and dusted, and that will then give us some, some you know, room to move one way or another. Yeah. Bigger picture, I'm super bullish US equities for the next 10 years. Um, you know, I, I'm super bullish. I think technology is really the new industrial revolution. I think we're just right at the tip of the iceberg, and I think if anything, this COVID-19 has, has really pushed that forward. Um, look at us here on Zoom doing this now. That's now the go-to thing. Um, yeah. and I think a lot of other businesses around the world, you know, technology side of things is going to come to the fray. So, yeah, yeah it's super bullish, bigger picture, but that's not going to come without hiccups along the way. That's for sure, like every secular bull market does. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm conscious of our time. We've got a load of questions here, so I'm just going to scan through them quickly and um, fire a couple at you. So... Um, since we're just talking about luck, let's have a question about luck from Ola. With regards to signal luck, how do you test a strategy for robustness? Well, we we run quite a lot of robustness tests. Um, we 
we do a couple of different things. So, for example, we do trade skipping, Monte Carlo simulations. We do variance testing. So, for example, let's say your strategy relies on the closing price. Um, what we would do is adjust the closing price by a random amount, one, two, three percent on a random uh, on a random basis. Run the system again and see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we do all these kinds of things to test robustness. We'd also look at the parameters themselves. We would optimize the parameters not to find the optimal parameter, but to plot the performance of each parameter to make sure we're trading parameters that are robust. That is, they sit in a statistically significant area. Mm. Um, so there's all sorts of exercises we do. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Nick. Um, question here from Al. Al, have you have you considered using inverse ETS to trade short using your long only strategies? Hmm. It's an interesting take. Um, I haven't. My only issue with doing that, and it's certainly worthwhile investigating, but my only issue is that a lot of these ETFs have very limited history. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I'm testing outright equities, we can go back, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of these ETFs, especially in Australia, have very, very limited history. And uh, I'd be a little bit concerned about that, but it's something worthwhile looking at, that's for sure. Yeah. Yep. A question here from Zach. Actually, Zach's posted a couple of questions. I might just pick this one. Has autocorrelation ever been a hindrance or a benefit to your trend following strategies over time? Well, all the, serial correlation is, is what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, um, we are trading highly serial correlated strategies or markets. There's, mm. there's no doubt about that. But by adding the different strategies in there and having the defensive mechanisms in place, i.e. trend following strategies going to cash during bear markets, you can get really good risk adjusted returns. So, you know, um, yeah, it's a problem, but every strategy has a problem somewhere in it. Um, we're aware of that. I don't think it's a major issue. It hasn't been a major issue. You can certainly have some, um, you know, interesting thought processes during different periods. You know, when Trump got elected back in 2016, I was 100% long US equities. I was sitting here watching the US futures go limit down, thinking, well, this is going to be a very nasty day tomorrow. But we finished November up 10% because the market turned around and just went straight up again. And it's very quick. So you just yeah. never know what's going to happen out there. You just got to follow those trends. Yeah, yeah. Another one from Zach, actually, which is, uh, brings up a point you just touched on a little bit previously. Um, suppose your back test your strategy entry and you find a cluster of similarly performing breakouts, say between 30 to 40 days. Can you randomly select a breakout day to reduce curve fitting and I guess the, um, the role of luck as well, perhaps? Um, go on, sorry. Well, if, you're gonna, if you've got a, a nice cluster um, between 30 and 40 days, you'd go straight in the middle. You'd just go straight to day 35 mm. and use that. Um, you could use a variety of different days if you wanted to. So I think that's called swarm theory. Um, but the problem with us retail traders is that if you're going to have multiple signals like that, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of execution going on, you're going to have a lot of brokerage um, drain on the account. But using a 35-day breakout, i.e. right in the middle of that cluster, and then reviewing that on a, on a semi-regular basis, you wouldn't want to go and review that uh, every week or every month for that matter. But, you know, probably once a year, you would want to re-optimise and see if the market hasn't changed a little bit. Um, markets change, you know. A yeah. lot of people say the total strategy doesn't work anymore, but total strategy, the breakout behind it works perfectly fine. It's just the 20-day breakout doesn't work anymore. So markets change over time and you have to adjust the strategy accordingly, but you don't over-adjust it. So our long-term mm. trend-following strategies, we would only adjust once a year, if at all. Um, so, you know, the, the main one which I've been trading since the late 90s, I think we've only ever made one real adjustment to that um, in that whole period of time. It's the exact same strategy. So robustness is very, very important. All our systems have very many uh, minimal inputs. Um, they are quite 
uh, rough around the edges um, and that's what makes them robust. So with that roughness and that robustness, you, you do have a bit of a bumpier equity curve, which is why I add other strategies to it. Mm, yep. And actually a question that just come up in regards to uh, changing markets from John. With evolving markets and influences, is it helpful to backtest decades in the past? Yeah, look, that is a really good question. Um, I'm not sure I have the best answer for it. I limit all my backtesting back to 1995. Um, one could argue going back before 2000 is probably problematic, especially in the US market where tick sizes were, you know, different back then. Um, we went into decimals. So one could argue that what was going on back then is not really appropriate today in terms of market structure, market facilitation, um, technology, all sorts of things. But I do like to see how my systems perform over extreme market conditions. So going back to 1995, you've got things like the tech bust, you've got uh, September 11, you've got the bear market 0203, you've got the big run up to 07, you've got the sustained bear market of the GFC. Um, you know, you had some big sideways periods there in 2014, 2015. So there's a lot of stress testers in there that, you know, you could uh, certainly put weight against. But I, I never really go back before 1995. Mm, okay. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. Now, I'm conscious of our time, so I think we should start wrapping up now. There's been uh, quite a few questions in the chat, which we can't get to all today, unfortunately. But, um, Nick, so people want to... Um, learn more from you or get in touch with you, how can they do that? So you can, uh, my main website is um, thechartist.com.au uh, or you can go to nickradge.com to get a, a, a look at all the different things we offer um, or you can drop me an email, uh, nick at thechartist.com.au, happy to answer any uh, questions uh, or follow me on Twitter, actually, is the best social media platform um, at The Chartist. Um, happy to answer questions there as well, Andrew. Okay, great. Well, I just want to share with some feedback we're getting in the chat. One from Landon. Landon, Nick, just wanted to say thank you. The concept of a portfolio of strategies has helped tremendously. Um, you're welcome, Landon. Here's another one from, or here's one from v, VJ. Nick, thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge over the years, the concept of diversification and strategies and diversifying, diversifying signal luck is pure gold. I completely agree. And one more to finish up. Zach Coram, great answers, Nick. Thank you for your research. Oh, sorry, your research really helped me develop my strategies over the years. So I owe you a beer next time I am in Australia. That sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> Cheers, mate. Years, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Now, I just want to do a couple of quick announcements on um, myself and then we'll have a final word for you. So um, I just want to announce next week we have Steve Ward, who's going to be joining us. Steve is from Trade at Your Best. He does a lot of um, performance coaching with hedge funds and um, and uh, CTAs and things like that, money managers. So he's going to be here talking to us about flexibility in trading, which is... Um, I think an incredibly important point for traders uh, to consider. Now, the uh, thing with this one is because he's in the UK, we need to adjust the time. So we're going to move it forward by uh, a couple of hours. So it is going to be next week, it's going to be at 3 p.m. Central. I think I've um, converted the time zone differences correctly because there is some time zone changes as well over the next week. So 3 p.m. Central, which is going to be 7 a.m. Australian Eastern Time and 9 p.m. UK. So that's next week, just next week only, then we'll go back to the normal time, 3 p.m. Central, 7 a.m. Australian Eastern Time and 9 p.m. Uh, UK time. So um, make sure you join us for that one. Now, if you're uh, probably the best thing to do actually is if you go into YouTube and you uh, subscribe, then you'll get notifications and um, you'll, um, YouTube will actually uh, work out the um, the times for you. I hope I got those times right because um, it gets a little bit tricky. And then one other thing, actually, um, 
on the empoweredtrader.com, which is, uh, for those people who don't know, is a monthly newsletter I publish with a couple of other traders. It is a printed newsletter like this one. This is actually next month's issue. Um, it's talking about um, parameter parameterless filters, which are uh, filters that have no optimizable parameters. So um, potentially uh, reduce the uh, instance of curve fitting. So that's empoweredtrader.com. Uh, it closes in a couple of days because then it goes to the printer to be printed out. So um, empoweredtrader.com. And then Nick, you can uh, get in touch with Nick from uh, thechartist.com.au. And uh, any final words, Nick, before we finish up today? No, just um, no? take the long-term view of it. That's all. This is not a not a race. It's it's a game of survival. And as I like to say, next thousand trades. That's what it's all about. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're getting a lot of thanks in the chat. So yeah, thank you again, Nick. It's really uh, great talking to you. And uh, a lot of the stuff that you, or well, all of the stuff that you shared, actually was really helpful. And I'm sure uh, lots of traders looks like they loved it. And uh, I can see all the chats going through. So uh, thanks again and all the best in the future. Cheers, Nick. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. See ya.